conserve can do is return what's called a 304 not modified. It means it can just truncate the body and go right. Stop sending any response back. You can use what's in the browser. Account. This will subsequently help reduce HTTP requests and improve the overall render performance. What else do we have? Reduce the number of DOM elements. Sites are getting bigger and more complicated. We've got web components, we've got pixel shims. I have a fantastic website where this, uh, when you run this, you get a score out of uh, 100 total. Each one is weighted differently. Uh, and uh, basically, I've got a great website, absolute success. So you are going to love it as well because uh, this is verbier.com. Or should I say rather, it was verbier.com until at the beginning of July, when uh, because they hadn't created this site, it got and therefore got taken. Fine. So this is the only copy that exists. Go to verbier.com domain today. It does not exist. Not to mention the former and current owners are currently in a lawsuit as the party owns the domain. So it's staying offline until somebody writes a check. Okay. In the meantime, this is a horrendous example. This scores, and this is my local, so I've done a couple of improvements to this, like minifying CSS and JavaScript. Out of 100, this scores about 68. My personal record is I think I've got a 90 out of 100, which is a pretty good response. Um, now, all of those 23 rules are great, and Weisslow was in particular championed by an engineer called Marcel Brand. Uh, if you don't follow him on, good. Because we're now going to move on to the next tool, which is Lighthouse, which covers, again, rules. Marcel Durand went on to take everything from Weisslow and help build that into the so without further ado. Now this is a familiar site. DevTools, elements, the console, network sources, the network, memory application, all the regular DevTools stuff. Over in the top right, we have audits. This is where Lighthouse is. So, and we take a look at what it can do. Now, it can test a number of different uh, scenarios for uh, with your website. Now we're only going to be interested in the performance one today, even though some of these are related. Uh, you can tell it, test whether it's a mobile or a desktop device. Uh, if you run this using command line options, you can actually specify pixel specific screen resolution so if you want to test tablets, that too. Uh, you can properly, and this is an important one, 75% still runs on a 2G internet. You've got 4G and 8 yeah, here, 8 meg or a 6 meg mobile phone connection. You are in the lucky 25% world. So not everybody has that privilege. So you've got simulated fast 3G, applied fast 3G, and have a CPU slow down. The device that it uses for mobile is actually Nexus. So this simulates what it's like on a slow phone with a slow now. So if, it, if it's fast on a slow device, it's fast everywhere. That's the theory, and it's a good one to do. So the audits it can run, there's a performance audit, there's a progressive web app audit. So are you using service workers for offline functionality? Best practices, so are you minifying your CSS and JavaScript? Have you got everything prepared for so on and so forth? Accessibility, you have ARIA tags, or alternate text on all of your images, screen readers, and SEO. Interestingly, one, three, and five are related. 2014, if your website is not fast, according to Google Speed Index, they will now penalize your page. So performance and SEO kind of go hand in hand. So what we're going to do is we're just going to run the performance test. What this will do is it will give us a score out of 100. Now, there will be a lot of statistics that flash over the screen whilst it's running this. So we'll put these side by side, watch. Go one Nexus five. So Lighthouse is warming up, and there will be some statistics read off here, um, including the fact that Walmart and Amazon both saw a one percent uptick in revenue for every hundred milliseconds they made their site. Think how much revenue Amazon made. Got to be they're worth a trillion dollars, right? So, according to market rules, say three to one revenue to value. That means they're doing about let's see three. Hundred billion dollars a year in revenue. So one hundred million seconds just turned into a three billion dollar paycheck. That's a lot of money. So here we go. Here is our score. Right, we get thirty-eight 
out of 100. That's pretty good. Let's find out why. So, a first contentful paint is 1,800, they said. Now, there's a magic number inside uh, um, uh, performance statistics, and that is, if you don't press something and sees a reaction or a response in six milliseconds, they deem it to be. We're three times over that already on a slow device. So, speed index, uh, let's see, time to interactive. Now, time to interactive is the first time you can actually tap and scroll or navigate the page. 20 seconds. That's horrendous. Go. First meaningful paint. So the first contentful paint is around about here, where you get some text and some image placeholders. First meaningful paint, where you actually get some content, is somewhere there or there. You actually get some images showing up. That's horrible. 3.8 seconds. Horrendous. We're miles away from our 600. Oh, that's where we really want to be. Oh, and the first time that your CPU actually stops doing work, before it then kicks in and loads, let's say, jQuery, Moodle, or whatever, 15 seconds. So your computer, your mobile phone is taking 15 seconds to load one web page, and it's doing heavy front end thread work all that time. So that's pretty horrible. Oh, not to mention also input latency, if you are scrolling through, it's 169 milliseconds below. You want that to be less than 100. Recent tweet and a blog post, but I'll pull up a bit later about it. So those are all the bad things. What can we do to improve it? Here we go. Now we get some interesting stuff. Avoid multiple costly round trip origin. So these are, look at these domains. We're now starting to look at how long it takes for a request and a response to come back from ad networks, analytics. USA Today, I'm sure actually, everyone in here has probably had to deal with the nightmare that is those four letters that are going to terrify you, GDPR, in the last few months, right? Everyone's had to magically deal with it, even though we knew it was coming for two years, because suddenly the legal and HR department went bollocks, it's due on the 20th of May. So, USA Today. Now, here's the thing. GDPR applies to every single person who is an EU citizen or whose data passes through an EU data system. So, even if you, me, whoever in France wants to access an American website, that American website by the GDPR to protect our data, European. So, a lot of websites have actually decided to go offline completely and actually just go, you know what, European addresses, we're just blocking you. Because we need the analytics, we need the analytics, and we can't guarantee your data is safe in compliance. USA Today, the news website, went the other way. They went, okay, the EU only, we are going to strip out every block of analytics, every adverts, you name it, the whole lot. So that what you see is just plain text, we're in control, you know, serving and managing your data, no third party. Their regular homepage is five now. One for EU citizens is 500. I think that tells you everything. But this website also suffers from exactly the same problem. So we have images and JavaScript being loaded from so many different locations, and each one has got an enormous over, well, in the order of upwards of 300 milliseconds. So let's see what's that. 700, 2,000, uh, nearly 3,000, 1,000. Yeah, that's five seconds. Five whole seconds of JavaScript, which we could get rid of. And that suddenly means that, yes? Is that Sorry? Is that uh, then, uh, I don't think so. Okay. No, it doesn't look like it. Because each one is measured separately. So I assume this would be the sum. Um, I could be wrong. So, uh, and also it would appear that each one of these one individual resource per domain. So, one resource, one domain, you can't use HTTP2 for reusable connections. So, uh, and yeah, the way the browser uh, streamlines those is yes, it will do them kind of in sequence. It will try and parallelize up to a certain extent, but if they're all separate domains, then it, I think the thread count uh, is. Remember how many? Uh, yes. Yeah. Download five at a time. Other thing. Yes, right. So you can open five separate connections, basically. So you can you can parallelize only five at a time, right? So uh, so yeah. So each, each one of those, even if you say five at a time, right? That's still five seconds. 
That's still an entire second, but I could just knock off that completely. So, so opportunities. What else do we have? Eliminate render blocking resources. Now, there's a CSS file in here, which because it rules it, it's a shadow box jQuery plugin. So like a little modal pop-up, which has rounded corners and a shadow behind it. On its own, just because of the download and the render time, it's 500 milliseconds. And you know what? I've never seen that plugin used anywhere. So there's a jQuery plugin, which has been downloaded, but I'm not even sure it's being used that's blocking render. It gets better. Uh, somewhere further down, um, there's actually a JavaScript in here. Anyone remember Moodle? So not only do I have jQuery in here, I've also got Moodle. So I've got double render on every single DOM element. Ah, oh dear. When I said this was a great example of how not to do things, I wasn't kidding. So, uh, well, we also have something interesting, server images and next gen. WebP. A couple, okay. For those that haven't, WebP is a new compression form. I think it's based on, I want to say, Brotly algorithm. So Brotly is a new compression algorithm, um, which claims to be, I think, seven times faster than it. You actually zip up resources and I think about 80% more efficient. Um, and WebP is based on image compression. I'll demonstrate what kind of savings you can have with it. Okay. Have, uh, my little standard logo. Nice little PNG, it is 28 kilobytes in size. WebP, 7 kilobytes. So that's a 75% saving. However, uh, WebP is only supported in Premium project. Edge has just added it. Sorry, we're still waiting. Because Apple wanting to adopt a Google standard like Steve to try and get blood out of trying to be resurrected. Yeah, it's going to take a very long time. Possible. Save a miracle. So, but 75% WebP hopefully is the future when Apple. Okay. So, but you can see the type of savings that using newer and better, providing it's uh, what else do we have? We have phone images, is that actually that much? We can generally leave that. What else do we have? More diagnostics. So I mentioned about DOM size, 4,000 unique HDR armor. That's pretty big. Uh, partly because this is a grid-based system and it's not a response. Nothing's been A significant main thread work, 8,100 milliseconds. I'm going to absolutely guarantee right here, right now, that is jQuery on low today. 8,100 milliseconds. That's it. Oh, here's an interesting one. Uses inefficient cache policy. That's a gap. I mentioned the cache control header. I mentioned the primary headers. This has nothing on it on my local machine. But that would be an instant. And even if you did, I would recommend Anybody offload their images, their CSS JavaScript to vault storage backed with a CDN over. Okay, so whether that's your blog with the Azure CDN or whether that's a screen with Clouds, move all your stuff to a CDN. Two reasons. One, CDNs are great at serving stuff, let them do their job and boom, dirt cheap. Two, um, <clears throat> by moving it over there, you're saving memory on computer. So one of the sites I worked on uh, was for the Formula E. This back. Oh, you got it. Right. So this is the FIA Formula uh, Championship. I was their website for very first champ. December three, uh, December twenty-four. When I arrived, here's what's interesting. This web page weighs about 6.6 .6 meg. It's huge. The average web page today weighs over 3 meg, which is bigger than the original Doom game called it, released 25 years ago. Absolutely dead true statistic. This weighs over double that. So, however, it's a motorsport. Okay? So we can expect high resolution, high quality sports photography. That is to be expected. However, they could do a lot to improve. But when I first arrived, we had massive problems getting the web server to do work. We had main thread problems, 
with C sharp razor template rendering. Um, and first thing I did is I discovered that there was a media directory with photos in there. It was huge. First thing we move it straight to Amazon S3. Uh, because S3, even on their free tier, gives you five gig of blob storage a month free. That's nothing. And on top of that, again, that they do, uh, CloudFront gives you 50 gig of data transfer for free as well on the free tier alone. Gigs. 10 dB. Right? After our first month, we served 70 gigs and it cost dollars. Right? Move your static resources to CDN. If you move to Azure, um, there is a command line tool that lets you do it, and the Azure storage cost 0.3 pence, approximately 40 cents. Uh, so not 40 cents, 0.4 cents a gig a month. So it would take you 10 years. Take you 10 years to rack up the cost of a cup of coffee by gigs. Ridiculous feature. I have no excuse to use it, okay? Not to mention, when you do upload this stuff, set metadata, which then translates into those HTTP tags, fires, so use blob storage, use a CPN. So, not to mention the other reason for moving to a CPN is any authentication, such as cookies, analytics, tags, anything like that, if you run that off to a subdomain, those cookies won't get sent. Not they won't be seen back either. So, trust table and your response will both have less data, less weight in them overall. This is a good thing. So, now, now we've covered Lighthouse, I'm going to move on to web page tab. I love this amazing system. And the reason I mentioned the overall size of the web page advice is there's a hidden, it's not just the we're all for serving it. Not just the cost of your blog store. Question: How many people have an unlimited data content? One, me, two, you, unlimited. Right, okay. fair use count. Right, so three. Okay. All right. Uh, who has got less than two? I know yours. Uh, okay. Right. How much is yours? Just five gig. Okay, we're going to see how much that costs. All right, so web page test allows you to test from multiple locations, multiple devices, multiple platforms. Choose, look, uh, we can choose from Android devices, Apple devices, locations. The default is in Virginia, in Dallas, that's airport just out. Uh, we've got a uh, location such as Chicago, Denver, Colorado, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and more locations around the world as well. We've got South America, Europe, with Paris there, and Strasbourg, Brussels, Belgium, and this is very long and very extensive. So you can test what your site latency is on a different from a ton of different particularly you run a service which on the internet so the other thing you can do is also pick your browsers. You can pick mobile devices, you can pick Firefox, uh, you can pick Microsoft Edge, uh, Canary, which is the Chrome Nightly Bells, got a whole gamut of choices. So we're going to just go over the default now. Our test. So this one's a cloud service, it's available on GitHub, which means you can actually download and run your own service locally um, as a service. Charge. Uh, and you can contribute directly back to it. Wait for that to come well. up. And what this also does is it does three test runs. It gives you an average load time as well. So it's not just once, it gives you a proper rolling average. So let me just wait for this. There you go. So what we get is in the same way that you do with uh, DevTools. You get all the different resources that are downloaded as a waterfall over time. You also get markers that say when DOM content, when the DOM content loaded is fine. That's over here. The bit I like the most is just up here. Section. This is where the actual way to your website comes down for frontline users. 
but one that you're running as a hosting partner is the cost on a data plan for your user. This is done using the operator, the largest market share in each given country, using the cheapest plan with a minimum of half a gig of data. Okay, so we're talking very low end data plan. Okay, and we take a look at this on a contract in US dollars in France, 13 cents. Just to load that page on a low end data card. 13 cents. Now let's think about this. Say that was a website a bit like Amazon. Like the homepage. Inefficient caching policy would mean second page. Search. Six cents. Look at the product. Third page view. That's basket. Four. Back to search. Five. Product. Six. Basket. Seven. Shipping. Billing. Credit card details. Thank you. That's. 12 pages. Cross entities that just cost you $1.44. That's before you even bought anything. Or even through your letterbox. This puts stark contrast, solid detail, how much your public service would use. So obviously, this is done at the low end of the but so these are tiny thicker. Start on the basis that makes one gig data. Right. Obviously, if you have 100 gig data plan that's 30 euros a month, then the cost will obviously be. But it puts in place, start, it actually puts a dollar amount on what it's cost. And that's something that you as developers should be. And your management of whoever you are working for, very consistent. And imagine you run a service with 100,000 users, that just costs $13,000, right? In data charges, that is expensive, right? So that's why I love this sir. really a number to it, one that you will never have thought about up until. So, all right. So now we've covered those three tools. We're going to go to the third side. Okay, need to. For some reason, latest version of JMEs is version 4. Doesn't pick up other run like .NET 4.1 L, V76, Ruby 7, version number for .NET Core. Right, but this is, ugly as it is, JMEs. So what you can do here is create something called this little thing. So, what we're going to do is we're going to create something. Create a group. And so we are going to sense that we're going to have two visit, carry out a set of production 50 times per. So that on its own is creating one, uh, 10,000 individual requests to do anything like that. Now, this is a very simplistic demo. Um, the real power is what I do next. Uh, what's called a sampler. Now, this is where the power of JMeter really gets to work. The list of samplers is phenomenal. Today we're just going to be talking about the HTTP. You can send requests to FTP, ADPC, load test, uh, your SQL server setup. But let's see, we've got the LDAP request, resiliency of your Active Directory. If you really want to hack off your network admins, then even 40 and bytecode data straight over the wire and you can do that we're just going to talk about the HTTP so also as an open source don't see something so it's got a full plugin architecture the options for the thing are limitless so the JMeter website will show you all the documentation one of the favourite things I like to do um, is I deal with kind of old school sites uh, I presume most people like that and what you can do with this is actually a user config element, load an XML sitemap, then subsequently take each URL, create that as a variable, pass that through to the site. Then what I can do is up a website that I use, and I can immediately identify which is a fast and which is slow because this will tell me what the server response is. So I can tell if there's something like a loop or a query that's causing problems in a given area of the website, just according to 
or else. So this is why I love this tool. So we're going to quickly just do this. Regular HTTP. Uh, you can specify a protocol, which will be HTTP or HTTPS. Go and test the website. And uh, we're going to use a get method. Oh, because this is HTTP. Oh, excuse me. Because this is HTTP, it also supports the full method of HTTP headers. Uh, get, these, uh, option, trace. You name it. If you want to fully run test a web API, you can. So, and you've got full response body. You can do a file upload, upload resiliency, and how that service would be. And you might the yeah. Actually, J meter. Yes. Yes, J meter. Because it's written. Oh, but I'm going to hold that against it. So, uh, we're going to test against my old Alma Mater, just the Formula E website, and lastly, going to go uh, uh, listener. So this is where the results can actually be outputted to a cloud. Where, where this gets particularly interesting, a lot of these file formats are XML based, and as a result, they can be created by TeamCity, uh, Jenkins, Seamless Integration Servers, uh, they're fairly standard form. So, if I'm not mistaken, they might be a unit format out. So we're just going to go with a graph. Nice, pretty. And then we're going to go. Now, one thing I do not recommend doing, do not press play within this unit because the threads will be my base threads and that will be slower than running. Jmeter also has the this test plan saved as an XML file, JMX file. So it was part of the is can actually run master slave config. So you can have your agent actually run a JMeter slave by sending this XML file. Uh, and then instead of having one server, three or four, ten. So you could take that file suddenly from ten thousand requests, you've got hundred thousand. And in fact, images that actually being displayed are available in literally rent additional load testing space for purposes of running a five minute. So, we're just going to demonstrate what this can do. Now I do. Right. And we've got our 200 threads up there already. It's two out of 200. <clears throat> our throughput is increasing. So the, uh, the average request time is in down. It's 0.3 seconds for HTML download. Not bad. The median value is 1.6, which means our, the median being the true middle value, it means the higher values are. Uh, above, there are values that are dragging out, kind of outliers, the being a bit slower. But generally speaking, the average response time is coming back in under or just over two seconds. That's not bad. And so far, we've taken half thousand signs. So that's a simple graph example. We're just going to shut that down. So, but the possibilities for what you can do with this are pretty. So play an experiment of ridiculously powerful. So, there's always one this. Notice the uh, my answer. Always one that holds. Reason? Oh, bye bye. Right. Okay, so that's Jamie. Next, we're going to uh, show off a mini profile. We'll talk a little bit about Glyph, about this and how we have So, mini profile is built by the guys at Stackage. Means if they like it, if they fitted it and they have it, it's cool. And this instance, it's already active on this web. All of these down here are individual background threads that have happened in uh, IIS behind the scenes. Set that one down at the bottom, that's my front end request. So, I'm quickly. There. Really slow. Oh, fantastic. That's absolutely horrendous. Got a total load time of 1.7 seconds. I'm going to go into exactly detail why. So, uh, so this is built on a content manager, Rocket.net, and open source. However, you can apply this to any web forms or NPC. It also supports entities 5 and 6 and 8 and D. So, 
uh, we have a full breakdown. Bit by bit, we've got a view, homepage.cx.xml, and that is taking 741 milliseconds just to produce the XML. This is the time taken by the server vendor alone. I know. Right? We're still outside that, and that's even before we get to CSS and JavaScript and images. So we're already way outside it. So, not to mention, if we go further down, individual razor views, I've got one that's taking 50 milliseconds, I've got one taking 120. Round them all up, and I'm getting to 1,770. That entire HTML page to be constructed. This is three times bigger than milliseconds. Now, I will pull out a worse. Um, and it. the old form of free website. I mentioned I joined uh, very impromptu. Um, I'd actually signed the very simple brochure. And I got a phone call asking what a sports engineering company. When I heard who it was, I kind of went, oh, I really wanted to work for these people. Uh, Formula E in their first season had wife was such a fun and truly enjoyed it. Sebastian Remy, and for a fan of motorsport as I am, you wanted to be. So I went and I did do the interview, and it turned out they needed my help. So I signed, I turned in the contract and went to work for these guys. I sat in for the interview at five o'clock. They were interviewing another guy at 5 30. One of the first things I did is I pulled down the source code, and I had at the time a laptop with about six. The fourth gen i7. It's still a really fast fourth gen i7, even by today's standards. And I pulled uh, the old Formula E website down and I enabled Mini Profiler. Home page was taking 4,200 milliseconds to render. In gig, i7. Yes. Mini Profiler showed me it was one macro, one little partial view, taking 3,500. Uh, milliseconds, and it was showing five slides. The reason it was so slow was the use of the first kind. Uh, I assume most people here are uh, oh, yes, uh, kind of, yeah, C? No? Okay. Uh, right, so for those who do know C sharp, um, words, one is var, where the type is determined at compile time. The other one is dynamic, where the type is determined runtime. Now, here's the thing about dynamic. Dynamic, uh, once it, it, it allows you to deal with objects where you're uncertain of the content, take the data, or the methods of action. However, so what it does is it by cat. This is where you start problems. So what it does, it runs methods. So I get, try and get an action. I get field, that's a problem. I get property over all the available uh, namespace, uh, all the available class types, so on. Members on. And here's the thing it does a try and then. Now, even if you don't declare an exception, memory, as a result, by using dynamic, you probably are going about 10 or maybe. Since you're generating 10. Result is memory, I'll just slow it down, along with implicit version afterwards, it runs again through another try block, get the idea. Dynamic only has one purpose within uh, .NET and JSON. For example, you don't know the contract. This is in advance. This is fine. Uh, you can get to the However, if you know the contract and you're using dynamic, I take your name. I will find your Twitter and your employer and I will hunt you down. I will tell you why. Once we remove dynamic from the Formula E home, that magic number at the bottom, instead of being 4,200, it's 97% by using static visualization. Do not use dynamic unless you are using JSON. Only accept anything else. Over well, time, if I ever find out where you work, I will be sitting next to you, pair programming with you. Make sure you remove every instance of it from your code base. Make sure it never re enters forevermore. There you go, that's the end of my preaching. So, 
All right, I will briefly talk about a Glimpse. However, the Glimpse project seems to have stalled. The game itself seems to stop working. However, it provides you a bit like, has anybody ever enabled Trace website uh, on an ASP.NET website? If you enable tracing in the web config, go to slash trace dot show you price. How will make some debug new Glimpse does that for you and more. Um, and it's available for both ASP.NET and Node.js. However, the website's gone offline and GitHub updated this. No idea how well maintained it is, uh, and I don't have any direct hands on but it provides similar insights to uh, mini code. So uh, you can find it uh, at npm.js, uh, find it uh, Glimpse, Project Glimpse, Node Edition, uh, and you can also find it at Ajax. Okay. Yes, here we go. Um, and yes, the last public release of the ASP.NET one was in 2014, so I have no idea how maintained I least, but certainly in the past, I thought it's a great package to use, at least relatively. By all means, feel free to check it out. I cannot guarantee whether it's also if you can it. But it is on GitHub. I'm hoping the power of the community needs to support more than stupid. So, all right, so now we've talked about all the tools. We've talked about front end, and we've talked about services. We've talked about how we use improvements. So, Back. All right. So we've gone over the tools. We now go. How do we improve our performance? If we take our White House example, verbio.com. How do we improve? And this is a very long list. So these slides will go up. Don't worry, they will be made available. But this list is longer than Robert Mueller's you know, list. It's also longer than the list of, top, of women that Donald Trump is sexually harassed. But you know, what can you do about that? He's coming, don't worry. So, we start with the HTTP request. Make your request small and as infrequent as possible. Cookie free domains, move your stuff to the bottom seat. Yeah, okay, it's cheaper than a coffee per month. Easier than default static resources. Now I will put a caveat in here as dynamic one. If you tease it and deflate things like let's say by endpoints or HTML, you can. However, one, I'd argue server resource needed for the performance benefit you gain is necessary. Two, there's actually a security risk if you're serving out that the DZIP uh, algorithm can actually be break apart reconnection. And if Dot um, uh, user secrets, education token, things, passwords, and so on, that can be detected stolen using a man in the middle of that. If you're in an environment, let's say, private corporate now, kind of firewall, your average user isn't going to. So, feel you're going to get a benefit of picking that data. Do. Okay. My general advice would be it's not. But especially for don't do it. Static resources. Also, HTTP2 does not solve everything. There's a new version of HTTP2 that it got ratified in March, um, but it's not perfect. Um, however, it is a good sign of things to come. Quickly. There we go. All right, so HTTP2 allows a couple of things. Firstly, it allows compressed headers. Again, reduces like this is up. Secondly, it has multicast connections. So very similar to the key life deck, uh, but more effective. So you can actually open one connection, multiple resources. And However, caveat, ASP.NET people that only works on 2016, Windows 10, and the OS 1.0. IIS will kick in. If your browser supports HTTP, it will be right. If you're working on an older server, or you don't have TLS, you should, because let's encrypt the Working on HTTP, or you're working on an old server, you're out of luck. The HTTP is being written into it. So, but this is what the demo looks like. Okay, so all that on the left was loaded. 
with HTTP 1. That's basically 100 different images, like you're using JavaScript, so that's multiple images and connections. Okay, each block is, it went a bit fast, so I'll run it again, but each block, individual connection. On the right, each block's been downloaded over one connection. Multiple resources, but it's a single HTTP. Which, if you are right with regards to the five cap, five HTTP, five HTTP two connections means you can download hundreds of them, not just five weeks separately. So I'll run that again. That took 1.15 and that took 0.74. So, I mean, obviously I'm working on a LAN connection, so this is fast anyway, but the fact that you can trim off what, uh, let's see, uh, 300 milliseconds just by using multicasting, that's a pretty you know, that's 25% before. I've been on networks where this has been a hell of a lot uh, substantial difference, basically. But that is the future, but it doesn't solve everything. It doesn't stop you from hashing resources, minifying your stuff with GZIP, so on. Okay? It's one tool in your arsenal. None of these things individually is a problem. You can't just go, I've done one thing, boom, we're doing it. That's it. Not. Each one has different contexts and different so you can choose your tools carefully but your performance measuring tools are a very good place to start identify where you need them. all right so now back to slides all right caching on static resources i've mentioned etags use md5 or sha1 read uh, identifiers to make sure that the browser knows that there's an ETAN. ios 10 by default which is quite nice. Cache control. Be very careful. There is an entire section of the Mozilla Developer Network pages that explain all the various uh, man, the, the keywords basically used in the cache control header. But it's a big header that covers a lot of things. Generally speaking, there's one big gotcha, which is called the public keyword. If you public in there, it means that any caching resource in between your server and the client can actually cache for you without knowing it. Yes, so corporate network proxies. Um, so generally speaking, you want to use the private word because that way it's only the local browser and nothing in the If you want to do a redeployment, then invalidate that cache using an e-tag. So expiry headers, if you can't use the cache control header or you find it finicky, powerful for your usage, you can simply just use the expiry header. Specify a UTC date and time when the browser will work out the time over the yes. Then I want to use the e tag. Uh, mo uh, most good web servers basically, when they see that there's a different e tag, they'll send it to so, CDNs actually support this automatically. So if you're using uh, blob storage, again, um, if you set an e-tag header on your blob storage, that mechanism, that uh, call and response, will automatically happen. Well, mm. it... Ah, the browser doesn't make that decision, the server does. So what happens is, let's say, okay, let's say you know the web page and there's a star. Starsheet has one e-tag, right? Okay? Browser caches it using the control header. Okay. However, what the browser will do is it'll send the e-tag request anyway. Okay. Yes, it'll send the e-tag request and then the CDN, if you change it, yeah, will have a different, will have a different, and instead of sending a 304, with all the content and the new cache expiry header. Yeah. So e-tags and cache control work hand in hand. The browser knows what to do. So uh, so yeah, basically trust the browser. So, all right. Now obviously. Reducing asset size, I mentioned the average web page is big. We can make this smaller, we should make this smaller. I've demonstrated the cost implications for data cache with this. So, minifying your CSS and JavaScript. I've not covered this in any detail. The reason is because go to npmjs.com. Now, I'm fairly sure most people are comfortable with npm. We are, after all, web developers. We are talking about JavaScript performance. So, if you go to here, and I just look up, this number keeps growing every single 1,844 separate packages. Oh, when I gave this talk two days ago, it was 1,837. So this keeps, this keeps going up, right? 
you have 1,800 packages available to minify your CSS and JavaScript. I'm not going to tell you which one to use. Okay? Some people say Webpack. Webpack is good at JavaScript. It's not so great at CSS. Uh, there are loads of others. You've also got tools in Build, Manual PowerShell, Concat Files. I'm not going to tell you how to do that or what to do it. Find one, pick one that works for you, and use it. Right? Simple. That's the simple lesson from that. So, one other thing, if you deal with uh, progressive web apps or you deal with mobile apps, which is not lazy load unless you are I like, think you're working in kind of an enterprise environment with no apps. Okay? Yeah, so you can rely on 100 meg or 1 gig Ethernet at all times. You can lazy load, this is fine. The rest of us have to rely on a 3G connection or Wi Fi on the London Underground. It works in the station, but not in the tunnels. So let's say I'm traveling along from where I used to live in Shepherd's Bush all the way to Oxford Circus, and I want to use Wi-Fi. I'm on the tube. I've only got 30 seconds to pull in. Next to the Wi-Fi, maybe I get one page view. If you're lazy loading, if I navigate and I suddenly lose my connection, I get a really nasty error on here. Right? It breaks the user experience. Don't lazy load unless you know it will work reliably. Bundle your stuff up. Okay. Bundle all of your views, your controllers, whether it's React, whatever it is. You and bundle, minify, and make sure it's served. In Use a service worker, save your stuff offline, and test for updates. Into. Sorry, excuse me. Service workers are perfect for this, um, and uh, that's exactly what they were designed to do for progressive web apps. So use them. So, but otherwise, bundle. Bundle and build in good error handling. One other thing I haven't mentioned is using an in-memory cache to build. Okay, so there's one website I did also work on, which is that boy. Oh. There we go. Universal Music Studios Japan. So one website covering 26 different sister and children record labels, two and a half thousand artists stretching from Lady Gaga, Justin Bieber, all the way down to your local J and K. Uh, and powered by Umbraco with over 165,000. This site was a. One of the things that we had a massive problem with, trying to simply not news on the homepage was news iterated over a query that produced over 5,000 different results, but from all sporadic areas of the site. The artists themselves, record labels, uh, publishing sections. Uh, and we had to show the top three date order in these uh, razor views. So, uh, when it was running the query to iterate, and trust me, I spent a lot of optimized. Uh, what we did is we actually, on the site boot up, we had three servers, uh, a load balancer in front of them. So, whenever we did an upgrade, what would happen, load in the new code, the app will resign. We'd have a background frame, run that query for us. All the five and a half thousand results and actually dump them in Razor because it was faster to query. We could sort all the objects by data or so just get the top three done. It took many seconds. And while that was booting up, while it was running that long query, which used to take 60 to 90 seconds, load balancer would go, Oh, you're unresponsive for five, boom, route the traffic over to the other two servers. So we do red green, red green or red blue deploy. So one, wait for the index to rebuild and then deploy the other two, basically. Yeah, don't be afraid to use these. However, there is a caveat with that, as with everything. Uh, so I've mentioned obviously RavenDB, Redis, Memcached. There's one type of cache we'll talk about, which is reverse proxy. Anybody come across it? A couple of people. Okay. For those that don't know, the reverse proxy basically acts effectively as load balancer. We'll take your request coming in, make the request to your web server, and then proxy the request out. So if let's say you take your 100 request one homepage. Then only one request gets made to the web server and acts effectively. And one of the most popular ones is called Varnish. Now, the reason I mention this is because uh, during the inaugural Formula E event in Beijing, web hosting company involved with our service uh, installed a Varnish server and then gave it to my predecessor to configure it. He misconfigured it. As a result, when trying to access certain pages, uh, people were being served caches. Other people, 
which included use names. This was an information data breach. The company was fined £25,000. The gentleman lost his job. So, thinking your cash is carefully. Could cost you lots of money. So, and as I've mentioned previously, the information about e tags. And if you know that you're kind of interacting with service environment, use e tags. Like let's say, for example, you have something you're actually going to be doing a lot of that request and response management manually using things like web client, a namespace. So where you can send 304s, so takes the response, client can go playing and processing. Server render, I have already covered Jamie, so I've covered Mini Profiler, I've discussed Glimpse a little bit, and I've discussed again, which will go on my gravestone. Don't use Dynamics in .NET. So, and lastly, we will talk about some more. Obviously, if we're going to talk about measuring and improving, we want to keep doing this over and over and over again. Because after all, you want resilient, strong, and stable websites. That actually happened last year. Sign fell off behind. Yes, strong and stable country, strong and stable websites, you get the idea. Keep at it, basically. Performance is not just something you do once and then go, that's it. So, uh, we'll talk about application monitoring, uh, such as uh, New Relic APM. Uh, I personally love New Relic. Whilst working at Universal Music Studios, we have Angular and Signal R to serve up both views against a Raven DB. In fact, that very same Raven DB that we use news items. This one, we actually used it to store an entire uh, of CD. So on. Uh, we were about to go live with this camera, except um, one of the requests was, oh, it was taking about three hours. Render time, mini profile. really only works with kind of visible views and API calls. So, we installed it. Oh, that was with And see, it's actually a was pretty uh, and be quite a bit times. No, it wasn't that. The was perfectly zippy and just this. Dug into the JavaScript, that what we did in the factory, managed all the that request is make the signal R request. And here's the thing about signal R is up sub So, if all that connection, we were doing is requesting data. Then, in the callback, it was actually a JavaScript call. And then closing the connection. So, I the Close the connection. Server render time. And it to our front end guy. So, New Relic showed us that. Uh, they do have a little bit of a free basic tier. I highly recommend those tools. Put it, get it, and it's uh, It's a little higher. Yeah, it's per server, isn't it? They've changed yeah. their licensing model. Yeah, no, yeah, it used to be a lot of. Which case I'm definitely going to have to chat that out yeah. to feed this back into the next next yeah. round of slides. Thank you. Data log, you said. Data dog. Data dog. Like, uh, uh, okay. Ah. I think that's it. All right, uh, so we've got New Relic. And we have to draw a soft loop. Now, this is more for the people who have the misfortune of having to work with desktops. Anybody deal with that? No? Yourself very lucky. Uh, basically, uh, Loop is based on a product called Post Sharp. Post Sharp is aspect oriented programming IL into it. That sounds horribly complicated. Basically, what it gives you is it gives you the, the ability to create attributes on your code like you would in MVC, and then uh, those attributes can be used to intercept your actual method call and change its behavior in the same way that attributes do. And, uh, Basically, uh, Loop is based on that to be able to add logging. And uh, PostShop, the guy who makes it is a guy called Dr. Gail Fratter, who's based on Trump. If you ever get your go, go, buy him a beer, and take one of the smartest guys on the .NET server. So the way he does those attributes is actually when he actually breaks apart the attribute code itself and wraps it around your memory. That's really damn cool. He does that into the IL itself. So your actual code is different from the C that's why this guy's a freaking genius. Go to Prague, have a beer with his team, you won't be disappointed. But yeah, it's designed for environments that don't have AO already, so non-MVC environments, like web forms uh, and desktop. 
So loop is based on logging. Uh, basically, it creates standardized logging attributes. Log two, log the net. Ah, they've got here as well. Uh, it's run by a good friend. So, and of course, I can not mention your application insights. It's standard default go to file new web application. Three is rudimentary. Personally, I prefer new relic, but having to given the problem, it changes. Uh, as you all might be one investigate. Don't worry, these slides will be available online after. And for front end performance, obviously, we want to do ongoing maintenance and things. So we've got my slow lighthouse web page they need to I'm going to post up a gist of a Docker image. This is a work in progress. But what it is is uh, Uh, right, so this is based on an open JDK report. Exactly. Does stores Jenkins for you, so the free open ISO. Then after that, calls the .NET framework and web features, including RS. So you can deploy an IS site to this. Then it downloads MS Build version 4. You get web targets, it. JetBrain static code analysis tools, that's free, that's for some memory profiling tools. Uh, N unit, X unit, and here we get to my additions. So you download JMeter, then we download YSlow for PhantomJS. So PhantomJS is a headless browser that's based on WebKit. Load YSlow in. It's a bit buggy at the moment. Working on fixing YSlow because as much as Lighthouse is great, Lighthouse is a might do a little too much for what Wyslow kind of points out some basics quick wins going so, right I can that that and that now then you then want to go into Lighthouse and run into so, uh, I also mentioned obviously copying things to Azure there's a command line tool called dead copy uh, then we've got chocolatey chocolatey is a desktop new get package it allows you to basically install using and it will do dependency as well. So you can install JMeter for Java, which is great. So that's kind of cool. And the reason is, is because Phantom Jack, which uh, Yarn, we need that for Lighthouse. Uh, Lighthouse comes as an NPM module. Uh, then uh, I've yet to put a Lighthouse copy like this. And then install web page test. Again, command line option, NPM module, web page test. So, then run a few defaults and then we get to the action. Uh, uh, yep, yeah. then get an IP and you get a service which runs at 8080. A full fledged setup with plugins installed. So that's got JUnit X it build. The idea of this Docker image is ideally what you can do is take a web application project, pull this straight in your Jenkins file, git file, immediately start running performance based. From your CI immediately, or within about 15 minutes, which is why it's going to go based on it. Uh, but then, if I check, yeah, so uh, Phantom JS, you simply pass it the, um, uh, the JS file that got downloaded in that zip earlier, and then you throw in, kind of do a loop where you can actually run it against multiple URLs. So, uh, ESB. Um, all PowerShell stuff that can basically run through. So yeah, I'll have that. that. Then you can throw all these. And even better, uh, when you run YSlow, it comes out as a J unit. So it actually comes out as a So you can actually fail a build. So you can actually say, sorry, my site's not performing enough. We add a new not performing. Right, we need to fail that build, it's not That's a really cool thing. So next. Got Lighthouse tests as well. Now they output the JSON. I'm working on a, a J unit, JSON to J unit plugin again. So we'll cut in continuous version four. Um, and uh, I have a page test. There's the example. Uh, and that can write out. And J meter, documentation for J meter is massively extensive, way too much. J meter, not a patch. Uh, but all, as I say, all the slides. I'll post all the links. 
Um, so other than that, um, everything. Um, in London, I will be uh, selling two-day hands-on tickets. If you like what you see here and you want to actually have real-world experience doing it, by all means, uh, tickets are on sale uh, next week, or I can come to your city uh, if you want me to come back here or you want me to come to business, uh, by all means, uh, fill out the little doodle at that link. Uh, there is my Twitter, there's my GitHub, I'll leave it up there, and I'll just ask it, is there any? No? no. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, fine. <laughs> okay, first one. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, so I recommend that uh, you check um, Rachel Andrew, Twitter, via the room. Both of them are involved with the CSS Working Group. They talk a huge amount about CSS organizations. Oh, there's one thing I did not cover, which is something called above the fold uh, parsers um, for CSS. What these do is they basically take CSS with different screen resolution. And so they create a kind of unified CSS, but only the rules that apply to those DOM elements that are visible and defer the loading to a lower down. The problem I have with those, how do you measure Because I've got this. Is a Galaxy SA. You probably have five or nine, it's something like that. resolutions and screen sizes are very different. Not only that, not only do I have that above the fold, that's also but I've got portrait and horizontal. I have to go to the left. What becomes above the fold? Well, it becomes very complicated very quickly. Given that there are over 20, that becomes a big problem. I know you're working with prices, but let's say you know you're working on. As out. Just use all the items. Right, use Otherwise, um, generally speaking, looking for optimizations in the business query rules. Well, I'll have a look and I'll post some stuff in the meeting group uh, tomorrow. And yes? Does it only uh, for a request or does it also? Every resource in the way uh, it can do that too. I'll demonstrate all right now. That's quite right. Uh, there is simply a very, very simple uh, little checkbox. So, loads, uh, if I could see. For some reason, you keep uh, okay. You are right. the bit you want is advanced and boom. Retrieve all embedded resources. So you can actually get it to the actual browser. Yes, that's JavaScript. Uh, you can actually specify um, uh, now the browser itself. Oh, that's a really good question. I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, I know it's Java based. Um, what it is, I don't know, um, but I will find out. Um, I think it uses a headless thing. It might be based on something. Not hundred percent certain. I will find out. It might just use regular HTTP. I don't, it might not even have a browser. So, um, but um, yeah, that's your option for that. Which one better rules? Oh, here we go. Implementation. That tells you what it's. So it's using an HTTP client for class or it's using Java's own objectives, not browser behavior. What it is doing is it's parsing the document and retrieving the result. Not browser based. If you want to do browser based, I only recommend Lighthouse. Lighthouse will do more. Lighthouse will work, will work with Chrome. So um, I believe uh, Edge, the Edge team is working on a headless mode as well. Um, I'm not so sure about Safari um, and ways the web drive. In web drive, uh, actually, a lot of command Firefox for my head. Um, but yeah, if you want something that actually acts like uh, this, isn't it? So, this is, this is more for actually for server side. I want to measure browser based White House, my site, web page, those will be better too. And to be honest, I think web page, given the diversity of. Mobile tablet. 
Don't post that. Uh, so you the command. These were. So you installed the uh, web page test module and that is on uh, so you've got a load command, you can uh, get test results, so you can run a test with a URL or a script, um, and then you can get page results from the find out so you can subscribe. Right, is you can specify one option, then get to specify SSL options once you Browsers, you can go custom configuration, Chrome. Uh, you can specify whether it's Firefox, Chrome, specifications. This gives you all the options that the website does. So, anything you need in your CI and your testing, that's the web page test is a better one. All right? Oh, well, I, well, yes, I do. I do. Um, do basically JavaScript. Uh, I think. Uh, I think that, that depends. If you're serving up, yeah, you basically have JavaScript, SPS, PHP. Um, I also. Right, I've got two opera tabs I here, mind you. Right, even. They say that they're making the edge. I'm on lesson. I'm on I ten. Um uh I think I believe in progressive way. I believe in much content. That depends. Available? I think the question is the answer is quite simply. Personally, my preference Razor and I have done that's what she's publishing using a static site generator. That's the but um, uh, I think you should Uh, yeah, it, there's no hard and fast. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, again. Okay. Uh, a few of them, sorry. Uh, that's uh, fine. Uh, oh, yes. Oh. Yeah, data. Data yeah, is yeah. bytes. Remove them. Always. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, those those constitute. Yes. And the many headers as yeah. yeah. possible. That's why I mentioned. Cause that's it. Look at something like the yeah, A session header. Suddenly, you multiply that up over 50 plus, and that's later. It's unnecessary. 50 static pages. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. HTTP2 will give So, that's an extra cool thing. That's fine. Um, um, mini profile. Yes. Um, it seems to be um, uh, yes. but, uh, it seems to be a server outside. Uh, that is correct. Uh, how does it work? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, when it's open source, you can go have a look. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't make it, but what I do know is it works really well. Uh, as, as I understand it, what it does is, um, if you are familiar with MVC Tribute, I think it creates an on-action Basically, it adds that to that is object that's held memory uh, for each request uh, that's processed by the pipeline and then builds that log and that hierarchy uh, using uh, MVC intercept when something started and when it uses MVC That's my understanding. Uh, the other cool thing it does start, which I uh, is oh there's loads of cool things um, yeah, of course. 
and that. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay. So see the bits in red. This actually shows you things that are running behind the scenes as well. So it actually changes your entity framework, uh, and uh, it can, uh, uh, basically just intersect into CQ objects. Whatever ORM you're using for CQ. And example, this CMS is actually using. Okay, uh, but it's actually got plugins for CQ. If you're not using it, it will pick up standard SQL, uh, there you go, execute with retry. So that it basically runs an intercept around certain known commands which are passed to point in the .NET world or it enters in the um, OTC request, OTC. Not to mention, all queries do come. Um, so yeah, so what that does is it basically So. Yeah, there is a lot of information, a lot of tools this does. Very, very powerful. Yes. Does it using AOP? Interceptor. Um, what do you call it? Well, you are just delaying the point at which we go. Oh, oh, okay. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, if you want to ask me the part, that's fine. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah that's, fine. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. There are uh, any other questions? We'll head to the pub and you can feel free to ask me that. But otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And even have to wrap off license. What, uh, sorry. Uh, JetBrains license. Oh, yeah. Hey. Yes, you have to wrap it off. You? Oh, I know I have one already. <laughs> Boom. Euh, bah, toi, attribue oh. une licence à qui tu veux et. Ah, voilà. euh, j'ai pas à ouais. choisir. Choose, choose one. Oh, ok. Hmm. Euh... Ouais, je pense. Soit au hasard, ou à ce... soit à la personne qui t'a posé la question plus pertinente. Ah, hein. ah, ouais, ouais, ouais. <rire> <rire>